So Turing machine is a device that simulates a computation. It's a very simple device. It has a tape on which input is written and the Turing machine reads its input and writes out its output. And the Turing machine is a finite state machine that reads writes symbols on the tape. So de despite the simplicity, it can do any kind of calculation. And the universal Turing machine is another Turing machine that can uh, simulate any other Turing machine. So what's so special about Turing machines? The church Turing thesis states that Turing machines capture the notion of effective computation in logic and mathematics. And all algorithms and mechanical procedure can be described in terms of Turing machine. So let's look at some other methods of alg defining algorithms. One is lambda calculus by Alonzo Church. It is basically lambda calculus basically function applications. So you have a lambda expression and a f that's a function and then you apply it to input and you repeatedly apply it till you get your answer. And then there is no concept of memory or there are no external variables. All the input is just a linear sequence of computations. So let's look at example. So lambda x y and this is the expression. So this is written the list way with the operators in the, in the beginning prefix way. So this is x plus 3 and y minus 4 and multiply the result and the input is x is 10 and y is 20. So it goes like this proceeds replaces x and y calculates the thing simplifies the expression. So that's called rewriting. That's called a rewriting system eventually get answer. So there's there's no concept of memory location and stuff. And there are two kinds of thing. One is the untyped calculus and the type calculus. And basically the untyped calculus is, is as effective as is as powerful as the Turing machine. It can compute everything possible. So and there's also type calculus which only accepts type data and the equal of power, equal power, but we'll be just not be concerned on this. If you're taking a class on logic, you'll be looking at this. And there's one more way of uh, doing competition is a combinatorial logic. And if you're more interested, you can look up Smolian's book, uh, To Mock a Mocking Bird. It's a very good book, Introduction to Combinatorial Logic. So basically, in that case, you have two co combinator operate uh, functions, functionals, S, K, and I. And as a calculus means basically doing some kind of operation and basically it's an untyped type of untyped calculus and basically it's same power as a algorithm and it's very simple it's much simpler than a Turing machine. The only two operators k, k takes two operator k takes two arguments x and y and it, it projects the first one x returns x and the s, op s operator takes three arguments x, y, z and applies x, z to y, z. And using SK, you can define all a bunch of operators. For example, I is lambda x, x. That means given any input, it's identity function. And if you define all this, you can basically have any kind of a string of operators. You reduce it, reduce it, and then eventually you get to some output. So SK, K, X eventually comes to X. And nothing else is needed but the S and K operators. So you get a string of S and Ks. And the rest of them actually just definitions. And then this is also as powerful as Turing machines and our uh, combinatorial logic. So lambda calculus. But we'll not look at this because it's a big field by itself and it's a very will be distracted from algorithms. So functional programming is an area of programming uh, which is different from the traditional iterative programming. Basically, it's based on the idea of, of functions and avoids the Concept of state and mutable data. What is mutable data? That is data that you read and write. There's no data to read and write. There's no states to save. You just take input and you just return output. And there are no side effects. And the other style, the, the usual style that we do in C is called imperative programming, which keeps data and states. And functional programming started from lambda calculus. An example Haskell, OCaml, ML, Lisp, Scala, Clojure. There are many examples. So here's a list in example. So define Fibonacci function and then takes n as an input and optionally takes a and the value starts with 0 or b is 1 and then it's an expression which, which takes uh, which computes if n is equal to 0 return a otherwise return Fibonacci it should be Fibonacci n minus 1 b and a plus b okay and the python 
Example of a lambda function, Python has a keyword called lambda is x, x into 2. So this is a lambda expression, it doesn't have a function name. It's a nameless function also, anonymous function and you give it 3, it returns x. So, so now let's look at some languages. This language is not programming language, it is a uh, automata languages and you'll be studying it in theoretical computer science and some other course you should have studied beforehand like regular expressions so and let's look at all of them because they define the kind of computations you can do the simplest one are regular languages and they use for pattern matching they use finite automata as regular expressions regular grammar so these simplest languages then they have context free grammars basically useful for pr parsing so like context free grammar push down automata like the parenthesis or whatever um, parsing parenthesis, parenthesis expression would be context free language you need a stack to count how many open parentheses you pass by then there are context sensitive languages these are basically lean, they need a linearly bounded automata to deal with them so basically you have these languages which are strings and strings represent computations and beyond that is some uh, more complex than that is the recursive languages these are algorithms and decision problems and these languages are basically accepted or rejected by Turing machines. So Turing machines are basically the computer and these languages are the class of uh, problems that the Turing machine can solve. So recursive languages are one that Turing machine will always halt. And the central problem of computer science was or uh, is that uh, the halting problem which says that given any input will the Turing machine halt or not halt and in general it's impossible to tell beforehand whether a Turing machine will halt given an in input and that is the same for true for computers also and then the we have the recursively enumerable languages these are the computable functions and the computable functions are like what Turing machines compute and that's how Turing machines come into play and this is the theory behind algorithms we will not be covering all of them we will be basically covering simple algorithms and, and at this point there are functions that are computable but if you get them a wrong input they may not actually halt okay so that's where the halting problem comes from and it's impossible there's a simple proof to show that it's impossible to decide beforehand whether Turing machine will halt or not halt so let's look at some examples what are these okay so these are like the calculators from 1940s maybe accountants use it to calculate mechanical there is also a mechanical register this is a register with 10 digits in each row and this is Babbage's machine in the computer museum in Mountain View and it is a mechanical computer and they used to use it for for counting uh, votes and for hollow uh, counting uh, patterns on for making patterns on cloth and there are many other uses of it for calculating uh, artillery tables so computers date back to a couple of hundred years not just 1950s onward so so before our, uh, computers came along there was something called oracle what's the oracle oracle this is a picture of oracle of delphi it's in somewhere in, in near Italy. and the oracle can basically answer questions that, that nobody else could answer it's like a it can tell you a fortune and why do why do oracles come in this so if you have oracle turing machine can solve a bigger class of problems which cannot be solved by regular turing machines so turing machines can be equipped with a oracle and then the oracle will say yes and no and the problem can be an e-complex class and so even undecidable problem, like the halting problem can be answered by oracle so this is just a theoretical idea it's not really implemented but you can solve different classes of problem given different kinds of oracles so sometimes we refer to oracles in advanced uh, theory of algor algorithms later on so and then oracle of delphi is nothing to do with a real thing okay but the idea is the same and this is a cray supercomputer so what's so special about cray and what's so special about supercomputer and so this is from the 19 uh, 80s I guess, or 1990s so basically it can do a lot of calculations at really quickly so it's measured in floating point operations per second which is a different kind of operation than the current generation of cloud computing these are used for simulating uh, engineering problems like engineering buildings or atomic uh, 
or bombs or whatever you want to stimulate or weather patterns and these crays were really expensive at one point and they probably still are so expensive and the central problem of cray was the was the heating they get really hot and large part of the coolant was really expensive cost was the coolant to cool the cpus and then we have the data center which are millions of pieces just bunch of pieces this is actually pieces this is over 1990s data center because actually you can see the the pc boxes and this is no longer the way and the plug points and stuff these are expenses that we don't need to actually spend on boxes we just need to have a cpu and ram and hard disk and network so a lot of cost can be cut but this is probably a data center from 1990s so you get either uh, millions of computer pcs and and this solve a different kind of algorithms where the data can be split into problem can be split into smaller problems and each small problem can be solved in parallel it doesn't change the complexity of the problem it just lets you do a larger problem quickly and that's how google and facebook and all these uh, distributed problem solvers operate and this is another kind of algorithm it's on a small board and this is the audio in and out and this is the video card and this is a compact flash ram it's probably mp3 player and the big part of audio processing is a fft algorithm so the fast fourier transform basically makes it possible for uh, computation to proceed at a really fast speed compared to the traditional computing of audio signals and video signals we'll look at that in a later class thanks